So I want to welcome everybody to our international camp meeting. It's uh, my honor to welcome you all. We're here for this weekend. There'll be five presentations. And it's my privilege to be the first speaker. Let's open with a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you. We want to ask and pray that you would guide and direct us. We realize the importance of opening and studying your word. And equally important for the privilege that you give to us to question you, to confront our fears and our concerns, and to speak openly and frankly to you about those concerns. As you have done in the past, we hope that you will hear us this weekend as we question you, as we question ourselves, and we ask for grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, the last time we met, I think, was in Germany uh, a couple of weeks ago. And at that camp meeting, in my presentations, we spoke about two subjects, I think. So for those who are not in person at this camp meeting... I have about 10 people with me. And as I try to do, I'll communicate with them and together we'll come up with the answers. And uh, the chat for my presentations will be off, so I can't take any online comments. And uh, because of our location today, I don't have a whiteboard, so I hope you can have some memory hooks as we go through today's study. Okay, the two subjects we spoke about at my presentations in Germany at the beginning of the year, January. Who's going to help me? Okay, so half the people didn't watch the studies. I don't think and they can't remember. Sorry. People diving into organization. Organization. So we spoke about organization. And then connected with the subject of organization, we or I brought up a, a related topic. What was that? Um, not that one. So someone gave an answer, but it wasn't the right one. So I wasn't going to have that translated. Okay, so the second point connected with organization. Catherine said that connected to that subject was how we go about selecting leaders. 
think she used the, uh, the word democracy. So this is a subject we've been speaking about, or I've been speaking about for quite some time now. So in December, sorry, in January, the frame, the, the framework was about the word democracy. But in the past, I've used a different context, but it was the same subject. Who wants to venture what the phrase or the word for those previous studies were? Speak a little bit, speak a little bit louder. Um, no. So Catherine said the personal is political. I said, no, it wasn't that point. So I'll give you a hint. Um, what kind of movement is this? Someone else beside Catherine. Rachel, what kind of movement is this? So Rachel said this is a prophetic movement. Does that mean we believe in prophecy or does that mean we're a creation of prophecy? I think we believe in prophecy. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Um, we believe in what we draw from. So my question was, you said we're a movement of prophecy. I said, is that... The, because we believe in prophecy or we are, are, are a creation of prophecy? Oh. Yeah, both. I was thinking. Okay, so uh, Rachel says both. We are both a creation of prophecy and we believe in prophecy. I think I was thinking about the parable of the, the worker. OK, so she speaks about uh, Matthew 13, talking about speaking about both about the worker and the plants. And possibly even the field. Okay, having said that, that wasn't the correct answer. But it was a good answer. What kind of movement are we? So this is, we'll say this is meant to be a radical feminist organization. Depending on the study, we wouldn't use the word organization. We could make a strong argument to use what word? A movement? Anything else? Um, a church? Yes. A kingdom. We'll go with kingdom. So I'm not going to critique any of those answers. Movement, church or kingdom. but there would be some that would say that we're not a church. That we're a movement. Because they see those as different entities. But if you're going to go to the book of Revelation, you'd be forced to use the word or term church. We're okay with that. Ray, if we were going to use church, what what church number would we be? Oh. 
yeah, from the seven churches, what number would we be? It depends. <laughs> so race head would be number seven. So Ray says uh, he thinks we're number seven, but we want to be number one. My translator is smiling at your answer, but you can't hear that. Um, Rachel, let's use Revelation 17 to give the answer. If you're not sure, just say. Lynn? Um, just a number. I'm looking for a number from Revelation 17. Awesome. You don't need to apologise. Molly? No? Yeah? No, that's fine. Um, Catherine? Terry? Okay, I'm going to go for number eight, which is chronologically after seven, because we're not Laodicea, I think. Um, so anyway, that was just a bit of fun. So we're a radical feminist organization. And that's one way of approaching who we are when we try to self-identify. And I've brought this subject up multiple times. And without, I hope nobody takes this personally, but I've been quite disappointed at the feedback or answers that I get. disappointed with myself and yourselves. Because we don't seem to know or understand what it means to be a radical feminist organization, as far as the answers that I've received. So I don't know if people actually believe that we are radical in our ethos, in our behavior, in our mindset. Okay, just to help the translator, I said ethos, uh, behavior, and mindset. So that, that's just to remind them. Okay, so I don't know what the group here think individually. But when I asked the same question in Germany in January, although people didn't say explicitly in the way that I'm going to say this, And some people said they didn't even know what they were voting for, if you watch those presentations. Some people said I trapped them into giving the answer that they gave. But I got the impression people were saying they're not either happy or comfortable with the way 
this movement is organized, the way leaders are selected specifically. Which to me, oh, what did that say to you? People aren't happy with the way leaders are selected. Hold that thought. Then ask the question, is this movement radical? Is it a radical feminist movement? And I would argue it's asking the same question, just phrasing it differently. Without telling you what I think, what do you think? Go for it. Yeah. Summarize my question again. Okay, so way back I asked, is this a radical feminist movement? Everyone says yes. And when I start probing and asking if people are sure about that, people get nervous. So I asked a different question. When I showed the organizational structure with all the people in leadership position, even if I didn't name them all, I asked two questions. Are you happy with the structure? Some people call it top down or pyramid. And are you happy that the selection process for putting those people in those positions was radical? Or good. We're going to define radical as being good. Catherine? Okay, so um, people are not happy with that, and they're saying that we're not radical as we are. So if people aren't happy with the way leaders have been selected, then they're saying that we're not really radical. And what are you saying, Catherine? Me personally, my opinion on... You personally. I like the way leaders... So Catherine likes the way leaders are selected. Sandy, how do you think leaders are selected? We have the leaders in the One second. Room. Go ahead. We have the leaders in the room. And when we discuss names, a name comes up, they want someone for position, and they decide. So Sandy says that the leaders get together. A name is brought forth. They have a discussion. And if they agree with that name, they get into a position. Is that a fair summary of what you said? So, um, Marilyn, how do you think leaders are chosen in this movement? Top. So it has to come from the top. It has to come from the top. But the ones that are picked for leadership 
have to be already involved in Bible work, Bible studies, you know, doing what they've done for quite a while. And then... Let me stop you there. So leaders are meant to choose people who have shown a level of competency already. Okay. Mm -hmm. Give me two or three markers for competency, please. Well, I would say um, certainly Bible work, if you want to call it. So the first thing Marilyn says is that they need to understand their Bible and have taught it to people. We sometimes call them Bible workers. So someone who understands the Bible and has some experience in teaching. That first summary? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's one marker. Can you give me another one? down to a more personal level, I suppose, how they care for those that are around them. They're constantly being in touch. So it's a personal level also that goes with that. So they have to understand and teach the Bible and also they need to be empathetic and sympathetic to, I'll say, the flock. That fair summary of number two. Anybody want to give a third one? Um, they have to show some kind of leadership quality. So they have to show some kind of leadership quality. Give me, you have to tell me what a leadership quality is. One second. Organizing people. Um... Organizing. Organizing. Are, are you happy if I call that an administrator? Okay, so we've got three markers. Understand the Bible and be able to teach. Be empathetic, be sympathetic to people's needs. And they need to have, we'll say, good administrative skills. Any other thoughts? Uh, Catherine said dedication. Well, what about the character? Doesn't it come in through? Character. I don't know what that means. We will what character. Um, it means that... One second. Okay. Come on. So I have to let them translate. That's why I have to stop talking. What character do they need to have? What he sees, what he hears, what they are. <laughs> so what you see is what you get? If someone's already in a leadership position, and they don't meet one of those three stroke four characteristics, what should we do? Go ahead. What should we do? Yeah. Well, if you're radical. Okay. You're, you're radical. Then you should do something about it. 
Uh, we should do something about it. Tell me what. Try to encourage the person, or you know, in the areas that the person is not. That... So we should try to encourage them, and uh, in the areas of weakness. If someone is uncaring, can you train that into them? I'm going to take that as a no. So would you fire them? Dismiss them? You really would. So the answer is yes. Anyone else got any thoughts? I thought, would they be in that position anyway if there was a little discrepancy on anything that they did. I mean, they've got to beat the standard right from the get-go. So uh, Marilyn says that um, if they were, if they had a shortfall in one of these areas, they wouldn't, they would never have even been selected in the first place. I wish I could believe that, Marilyn. I'm not saying that they don't have failings. They do. But should... Oh. A second. Go ahead. I'm not saying they don't have failings. That's not the issue. There's just certain criteria that you need to be able to be in that position, that leadership role. And they can they all have failings. I mean, I'm not... But I think it's how we draw the line, you know, and we're all critical at times. Okay. So it's, everybody's got failings and it's how we deal with them. So several of the answers have said that we, the leaders need to get together and do this selection process and it all sounds really good. Until you ask the question, what question would you ask, Elder Terry? When all these leaders get together and do their selection process? What question we would ask of the leaders or of the person being? Not the person, no. What we would ask of that Someone's proposed, several of you have proposed, the leaders get together, they do a selection process and it'll all be good because they've got some criteria. Let me put it, what's the elephant in the room? <laughs> Elder Terry said, are they radical? Who is the they? So we question one another. I'm asking you when you said, Elder Terry, Terry said, the they, are they radical? I asked her who the they were. So Elder Terry said the candidate is the they, are they radical? So what I want to ask is, are the leaders radical? So the leader is the elephant. Oh, sorry? So the leader is the elephant in the room. So I'm suggesting the leaders are the elephant in the room. They're, where the, they're the thing that people are afraid to discuss. Back in the day, Sorry? Yeah. Back in the day, tell me what year 
and how many elders we had. Go with the year first. Go with the year first. Josephine? Think up till what 2014? There's only one. Not 2014. No. 2001. 2001? No. No. <laughs> so, oh, sorry. We had um, 2014, we had 2001, and then we had 1989. And the hint, they were all going in the wrong direction. Two thousand nineteen. Two thousand nineteen. No. Two thousand sixteen is the answer. Ray, how many elders? How many leaders will go with leaders elders? Five. five, Ray said. Wasn't five. Molly? Two. Molly said two. When they, when, they, when they hear these answers, they're not going to be happy. <laughs> these, these leaders. Seven? Seven. No. One? one? Yeah. Who was that one? Yeah. No. Josephine said it was one elder Jeff. No. So three. Three is the answer. We'll go for three. Okay, so Marion, you're going to give me the names? No. Myself? No. Not, not Tess? You can confer and cheat. Oh, Tabo. Tabo? And the one from South America, he's going to like that when he hears that. Oh, the no. one. Listen, Marco. The one from South America. That's what they. That's what they said. You you heard it. You heard it live from Australia. Okay, so we had three. Tell me why it was three. Lynn said because Elder Jeff decided. Are you going to translate that? So it was only three because the fourth one didn't turn up. Tell me how radical that is. Couldn't come, couldn't make it for whatever reason. And I'm not laughing about that. But if the person had turned up, we would have had four. Okay, so the three stroke four people. And I'm not making a point about them being men, not women. What's the selection process? Have a guess. Is it those four beautiful things that you all mentioned? So everyone online, people are smiling when they ask that question. The people here are laughing. Okay, so the answer is no. What was the basis of selection? So Marilyn said she'd actually like to know. 
She waited eight years to find out. I never asked. <laughs> okay, we're gonna we're gonna answer the question now. Hopefully. Spiritual Ray. Spiritual qualities. Like that, having a good spiritual life. So Ray is is that a question? Can't ask questions. Um, we're going to like having a spiritual relationship. So, so Ray said those four qualities we mentioned um, about studying, empathy, administration, good character. Those were the characteristics. Uh, he wants to believe that. And Lynn, and Lynn knowing the truth said what? The how the decision was made as to who is that's what I was answering. Okay, so Lynn has answered the wrong question. Tell, tell me what the basis of selection was. Favor of approval of being teaching the same thing. In other words, the leader approved of what they were believed in. Okay, so Lena said the reason they got selected is because they agreed with Elder Jeff. So I think that's unfair, Lynn. Because you're already a member and got baptized because you believe what Elder Jeff believed. So Josephine has said, was it because of geographical location? So I'm going to say no. Because I know people who live in this location would disagree with me. But Central America and South America are almost the same. People who live there would not agree with that, I understand. So we've got a Canadian. I'm going to say two South Americans. I know one is central. And this is not literally me, but a Brexiteer. I can't even say a European. So there are large areas of the world that are not properly covered. So it wasn't really based upon geography. That's, are you familiar with the word spin? We'll use the word fairy tale because you all know what that is. Geographical regions is the spin or the fairy tale story that we gave afterwards to legitimize what was done. So I'm in Australia at the moment, Australasia, uh, Oceania. And I think it would, for the members here, I think it would serve you well if you knew a little bit about your own history. Movement history. And why you're not at the very beginning on that list. So we're not going to go into that, but I think it'd be worthwhile you having a study on that, just so, because I'm guessing some of you are not familiar with why 
you weren't part of the three stroke four and it should have ended up being five perhaps why that didn't happen okay so for me the problem that this movement faces without disparaging myself or person from South America and Elder Tavo. Yeah. Is that we were all chosen because we were good friends of Elder Jeff. It wasn't even because we were the best at Bible studying. Or that we were all empathetic. Could argue that we we're all pathetic. And I don't know if we're really good at admin. Catherine. Is there any element of any of you having a story thing they got involved in the start of that? So was there an element of we being led by God? So I think the simple answer to that is yes and no. Depends who you ask. If you asked Elder Jeff, it would be a yes. Because he would view everything as we'll call it providence and not to speak on behalf of others but if you ask myself uh, no I think he just liked me to be honest and that seemed to be enough for him so why do you trust the leaders who were put into positions of responsibility but at least on the surface appear unrighteous reasons and you expect them to select leaders on a radical feminist or just a radical basis Any thoughts? Do you have a thought, Josephine? Yes, because since then the message has grown and maybe people have changed. So from 2016 to now, uh, Josephine has suggested I've grown into my job. And for whatever reason I was chosen, actually it's turned out good that I became one of the leaders. Is that what you said, Josephine? Yeah, taking your job more seriously. So Josephine says yes. So the next leader we choose, I can choose anybody because you're all my friends and then you'll just grow up into the job, which is just breaking all the rules that Marilyn gave to us a moment, moment ago. She said you have to demonstrate before Four. You want to say something, Josephine? Yes, but what if you you were selected before Mel's? Ah, so the problem is, what do you do with legacy issues? First of all, should we not approach them? 
honestly. And then decide what you want to do about it. Those early leaders, do we analyze them and get rid of them or see that they've grown and keep them? What would a radical movement do? Josephine? Yeah. Which? So Josephine said a radical movement would analyze them. But you also said that they could grow into the job from failure to success. Okay, I didn't understand what Josephine just said. We don't really know what's in the heart of the person. So Josephine says we don't know what's in the heart of the person. Quick show of hands. Who agrees with Josephine? Who disagrees with Josephine? Oh, it's 50-50 and half the people didn't vote. <laughs> so, like, question. In 2016. In 2016. Were you honest? <laughs> was I honest? As honest as I am in 2024. <laughs> but you started off in a movement back then that you could categorically say no to that you didn't do back then. Yes. And the point being? Well, it's all about honesty. So Marion says that it's all about honesty. How can you do Well, I'm a politician. Some people call me a political animal. I prefer the term pragmatist or realist. And would you trust someone like that to tell the truth? Would you marry me? I think it's very important to say what you mean and mean what you say. And then hopefully everybody else understands what you're saying. So Marilyn says, Marilyn says it's really important to say what you mean and mean what you say. And that's the biggest thing I get accused of. Of not doing that in all of my studies. I'm not accusing you of that, am I? <laughs> so, I don't want to do that. Marilyn doesn't want to accuse me, so I'll self-accuse myself. What I want us to understand and think about is if you're going to create a movement, would it look like this? And if you're going to have a set of leaders amongst all the thousand people, thousand members we have in our movement, Who would you choose? And more importantly, on what basis would you choose them? We've got what we've got. And the question is, do we just carry on with that or do we pause? 
understand what it means to be radical and then decide whether or not changes need to be made or do we just pick flawed people flawed means not perfect and let them grow in the job and the problem with that idea is that when you get a job in the church we'll use the term church now what ends up happening once you get your job what did Terry Got it, belong. it it ends up becoming a job for life It's hard to get rid of people because we don't want to publicly accuse people. We all want to look nice. No Sandy? So Sandy's brought up another point. I asked about the selection process and we had all these noble thoughts and the reality is most of the time we can't get anybody to do anything. Which means you have to scrape the barrel, we're familiar with that term, you have to go to the bottom. and get anybody we can to do it. And that's a, obviously a really bad way of operating. So I want us to really consider whilst we have some time left, what you think this movement should look like and if it if changes should be made and if you hurt people's feelings so be it molly i think uh, at the moment if we claim to be a radical movement then everything else that we do, even the selection of leaders, have to be radical. Everything we do, we need to have to succeed. We need to turn, go around the bush, but straight forward with everything. So Molly said, if we're a radical movement, the radical members should choose radical leaders. Problem is, members don't choose leaders. Leaders. So the existing leaders are going to choose radical leaders. Okay, who would choose a leader who has not done baptismal classes? Would you choose a leader who hasn't done baptismal classes? No. Okay. So Graham says yes. He would choose a leader who has never taught a baptismal class. Graham, do you not think it's important for them to be able to understand the message and teach it and to be uh, to be to demonstrate that? So Graham said, yes, it's important, but you've also said it's not, it doesn't matter if they have demonstrated that or not.
and that she didn't understand my question. I have come in late, so I may have missed something. You, you missed nothing? So my question is, if someone has never taught has never taught a baptism or class, so we don't know if they understand the mechanics of this message. Should they be selected as a leader? Okay, so Graham. I think maybe didn't I didn't frame the question correctly, and he's saying no that they shouldn't be. We all agree with that, Rachel. Hypothetically speaking, perhaps. We have a leader in the movement who hasn't done any baptismal classes. What do you suggest we do? So if they haven't done any baptismal studies, then having that foundation um, I think it's essential to know how to teach the message. Um, so they either have an opportunity to teach them or um, if they're willing to teach them and um, wanting to teach them. Hello? Um, then I think that just shows that... Um, they're willing to um, find a word. willing to take that opportunity to um, to be a good leader, like wanting to take that that on board and, and actually apply it. So Rachel has said an existing leader who has not done baptismal classes. They shouldn't be fired, dismissed, but they should be given op an opportunity to do some baptismal classes. How many classes should they do? How many? How many sets of vows? How many students? Is that 13? Or oh, no. One student will do 26 vows. Six months, approximately. How many should that lead? How many students should they go? Should they take through studies? Four. So they need to do two years of study of teaching before they would be considered competent. If they say yes, all good. What about if they said, I'm too busy? Catherine? So Catherine says, fire them. Chris, they say, I'm willing, but I'm not a good teacher. I don't know. What do we do with them then? willing then have that opportunity to do it so they're willing to do it but they're just no good
taking somebody to through 26 vows for six months, once a week, plus or minus, is, if done properly, is a task and a bit. If you, if you, I don't know if you're a baptismal teacher, but if you ask those who do it, it's uh, you really need to know your thing, your stuff. You do it properly. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, others to determine. Yeah, so you said to the so Chris said someone has to make a decision. So, so I'm asking you to make the decision. What would you decide to do? So it's obvious that they're, they're not good at that particular job, is that? Yes, they're not good at teaching. You tell me what you want to do with them. If this was the US election thing, you wouldn't you know what to do? You wouldn't vote for them. Which means they lose their job, I presume. So we agree with that? If they're not good at the job, what's the point? So if they're not willing, fire them. If they're just not any good, Fire them. Not unless you can have a refresher course that's something tailored for a particular person. Okay, so the suggestion is this leader who doesn't know how to teach, doesn't know our, we'll call it our 26 fundamental beliefs, someone has to now teach them all of that so then they can become a teacher to teach someone else. And in the meantime, who's teaching the flock? The you. <laughs> so we're going to replace the person. Anybody got any thoughts? Let them do a bad job. Elder Terry says, let them do a bad job. Josephine. If you're willing, that's up to that. And if that person can be taught, then that person will, will do a good job. So if you're willing, then that's half the battle. So they're going to go to bound number six, practicing on this innocent block member they don't know what they're doing I say hold on they speak to their friend and say Terry how did this vow go get a quick refresher course And then carry on with the study with the member. I think that's what Elder Terry and yourself have said. Marilyn first. If he doesn't know how to do it, or there's particular reasons why he can't, 
and he doesn't know the vows, how can you teach something that you don't know? Generally, that's the problem with not being able to teach. And I mean, people get nervous and you've got to, that's just part of presentations. So, so Rowan says, how can you teach something that you don't know? So he has to be dethroned to start. So you have to fire her first, her or him. Whoever. Okay. Not fire necessarily. So let me clarify, we will fire a female leader because she can't teach. Well, she can't teach. What's the problem? It's not racist or sexist. I'm not looking at this from a sexist point of view. I'm looking at their faces and they all think it's sexist right over there. Yeah, but it's not. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> um, Molly. Isn't that what Jesus was making reference to blind lead the blind? So Jesus is making reference to blind lead the blind. Who agrees with that Bible verse in in the context that we're talking about? Is that a correct application of that verse? Blind leaders of the blind. Anybody got an opinion? So this is Matthew fifteen fourteen. Molly, you and I, all of us, are we the disciples, the twelve? Or are we the priesthood, the Pharisees, the scribes? So we're the disciples. And so if you make an application, as you've just done of Matthew 15, 14, at a minimum, we have to be really careful to apply a verse like this to us. Don't we fall in the same category? Don't we fall in the same category if we allow somebody who doesn't know what he's teaching to teach the, the block? So Molly says if we if the hat fits, then wear it. If you're familiar with that term. You familiar with that phrase, my translator? Okay, good. So the problem with that, what's John called? The son of the son of thunder. Is that a compliment or an accusation? A compliment. I think in the context, it's actually an insult, not a compliment. He's an angry man in a leadership position, which according to us would disqualify him anyway. And he's teaching people error. And we could go to the other 10 and show, show really s simply that they're all teaching error. We'll go back to their leader. Who's their leader? John the Baptist. John the Baptist. So was, did, was John the Baptist good or bad? Was John the Baptist teaching error? Yeah. So his teaching error. Is John the Baptist blind? 
I'm going to suggest that John the Baptist wasn't blind. And that even though he had misunderstandings, he was bringing people to eternal life with the errors. But these people, these are blind leaders. And it says leaders of the blind. And I think John, Matthew, the others, they weren't blind in that sense. So I would suggest that a verse like this shouldn't really be used to apply to us. Because this blindness, it's deliberate. Those leaders are deliberately blind because they reject the truth. And John the Baptist never did that, as you know. James. Going back to the um, hypothetical leader, um, I was thinking of the parable of the um, sower, the experience of the service and the seeds in the field. So James is going to take us back to Matthew 13. I was thinking, even though... Go ahead. I was thinking, even though he's a bad teacher, he, he needs that experience to teach. So James is making the same point that Josephine made and oh, the Terry made, that they need the experience to teach. Any other thoughts, any question, anything, questions on this? Ray. When you first started talking about are we a radical movement this evening? Um, I kept coming back to what we had been taught about what radical means is to get to the root of a problem. So when I brought up the subject about whether or not this movement is radical or not, Ray was reminded of the meaning of the word radical. So several people have spoken about removing people from leadership positions because they're not good at their job. And that whole mentality or way of thinking reminded Ray of uh, a TV show Is it called The Apprentice? Or? Apprentice yeah. yeah, I think it's called The Apprentice, where Donald Trump would fire people who didn't meet the mark. So Ray says... Firing people isn't the way to go, but he doesn't know what is the way to go.
uh, which means that we don't fire people. I think there are certain circumstances where there's just hard no, that's things that certain behaviours are not okay, but... Okay, so there are, we're not talking about criminality, but you're saying that we don't fire people. But I, I think, I don't think firing people is the way to go. What is the way to go? Tell me how you will rehabilitate Emma from the UK. So if um, I'm at work and I have a subordinate who doesn't... No, how will you rehabilitate Emma? So the example that we've been using of letting someone take um, baptismal studies you let them take more baptismal studies and try and work with them if there's areas identified where they can improve. So you won't, you don't have any access to her? So you won't rehabilitate her? So you would rely on, you would trust her members to do that? And her peers to do that. Yes. Better leaders. So you would trust the system and the process. Okay. Anyone else got any thoughts? Josephine. Are we concerned, um, say, if you fire somebody that's been selected as, as a leader, the process will be done really carefully because we could lose that that particular person, and I don't think that's our motive for doing it, but... So Josephine said if we do fire somebody, we should do it carefully. I think everybody, any reasonable person would agree with that? I I think maybe something to that they could take it as shame, you know, they've been doing this job and then they've been fired. Um, they could lose their... They could lose their eternal life? Look around and can walk right out. I'm, I'm concerned about that. So whose eternal life should we worry about? This or the collateral damage that they do in the movement? Who would you prioritise, the leader or the member? That sounds like a whole lot of people. So if you have to choose one, a group. So someone at my level, if I do or say something wrong, it affects lots of people. The higher you go, the harder the fall. Let me ask another question. We've spoken about leaders should be able to teach. We've got various levels in our movement. How far do you have to go in this organisation before you say they don't have to teach? So there's me. Continental leaders, then local leaders, then board members, and then we'll say you, lay people. I'm, I'm going to go with five levels. So if we're going to talk about removing people, At what level do you say we can stop now? Lynn? I think they all teach, don't they? They all should all teach. Shouldn't everybody in the movement, even all the members, teach? Isn't that what 
the priest was supposed to be teaching. Okay, so then um, you can't ask questions. You have to just give answers. Just tell me. Okay. I think everyone was supposed to. Okay, so we go right down to the members. And what happens if the members won't teach? Are they really members? That's a question. You tell me what you do if someone says, I won't teach. I'm just I'm just a member. Then you could question whether. Start by saying I would. I would question. They were really a member. Why you question yourself? You question them? Who are you questioning? Well, right, form the question. Are they coming to me or am I making a decision? What, what's the relevance of that? I'm asking you where your theological understanding is. So my understanding would be if someone does, is refusing to teach at any level because it can be small level, very low level, even just one on one occasional things. If you're refusing to teach anything, you question if they're a member, really. So you're saying that you don't consider them to be members? Uh, I question it. I yeah, who are you questioning? Sorry? Who are you questioning? You're questioning them in your mind. Are they a member? So the answer is they're not a member. If they're refusing to teach anything to anybody at any time. So Lynn says, if you're not teaching and you're a normal member, you're not really a member. That's more or less what I said, yeah. Okay. Um, that's right, but that's what I said. Molly. With all the levels that we talk about, aren't we supposed to be priests? We're pri uh, Mary says we're priests. Yeah, if we are priests, we mean to teach. And whatever level that we have, we teach what we got. And the primary role of the priest in the Bible is one of teacher, the head of the fu uh, job functions. So that means we should all teach. So the 80% of our movement that don't teach, what, what are they? Priests. In the lower grade. They're lower grade priests. Like below members. And they're still priests, but we all, as priests, we're supposed to go to the lost sheep. We are not lost sheep, we are priests. We're supposed to go to the lost sheep of Israel. Okay. Uh, Elvis Terry. Any thoughts? At what level? All levels should have the opportunity. So all levels should be teaching. And what if people won't teach or don't teach? Okay, so I'm, I need to finish up, I think. Yeah, I've been called cool to finish. Oh. Okay, so my question is, you said everybody should teach in this movement. So we've moved away from this idea that only leaders are required to teach. We've come full circle in saying everybody's required to teach. Yes? What happens if someone says, I'm not teaching? We can't force them. So we can't force them. Can you force one of the first four levels? Yeah. So we can force one of the first four levels, which was leader of the movement, continental leader, local leader, and board member. We could force them
because it's a requirement of leadership. But this is something that all members should be doing. Because as Molly said, we have two models that we're working with. Two structures, if you like. A horizontal structure and a pyramid structure, or hierarchical. And we have to juggle the two. We're all priests. And yet, even though we're all priests, organizationally, there is a hierarchy. Anyone else got any thoughts? James? I just wanted a clarification of what teaching what teaching covers. Is it sharing or is it in front of uh, other people or is it just baptismal vows? Because I'm a little... Uh, okay, so people want to know what teaching means. So if I give a really silly example... If I baked a cake for you, went through all the time and effort to find a recipe, got all the ingredients, read through it, and did an awful lot of work to create a cake that was pleasant, is that the same as me? going to Coles and buying one for you? No. So you get a cake either way. So maybe that's not a good example. But if we're a, a movement of prophecy... which means we're created by prophecy and we believe and teach prophecy. Or as old as Jeff used to call us, students of prophecy. Or priest, or the wise. Teaching isn't sending somebody a spirit of prophecy quote or giving them the odd message. It's going to vow 12. Josephine, what's vow 12? Yeah. Josephine, yeah, sorry. sorry. Did I get your name wrong? Sorry. sorry. What's vow 12? The subject or the theme of vow 12. Okay. okay. Are, are you on vow 12? I don't know if you've done that. Maybe you haven't got there. Yet. I don't know if it's in your baptismal studies or not. Uh, Lynn? Oh, she cheated. Graham? You can cheat if you want. I don't know. <laughs> it doesn't help to cheat. <laughs> Okay, uh, we'll get Elder Terry to help us. Elder Terry, what's Val 12? So the nature of humanity. We've got, say, 50 teachers in our movement. Who do baptismal classes. And you get different qualities of teaching, of course. But to take somebody through that, just that one vow, even if you do it badly, I would say that's what I'm referring to when I say teaching. How many paragraphs is it? There's quite a few. Four. Four. There's four sections. 
and quite a few Spirit Prophecy quotes. So if, you, if a teacher went systematically through them, they'd cover a lot of territory. Even if they didn't, even if they weren't experienced. I think that's what teaching is. I don't think it's having a conversation about what's going on in the US election cycle. That's necessary. But I don't think it's what I'm referring to when I talk about teaching. Molly. Some of us, we might be ashamed of speaking and that, but all our vows, they live it out in their lives and they win souls that way by the fruits. What's the point you're making, Molly? About this, because if we require a friend to teach and they cannot teach. So Molly's saying we require people to teach, but they can't teach. Yet they live out the message according to what it is. But they live out the message. What? How can you live out what you don't understand? They understand the message. They know they know what's the vows and all that. But they can't just teach it literally, but they can live it up in their life's experience. So Molly, Molly says that they know the vows, but they can't teach the vows. Do you think that, that there are some people in the movement who can't teach vows? Yeah, I sound really, very shy to So, Molly says they're shy. I ask, are they capable? Yeah, they, they, I believe everyone is capable of teaching. You said they uh, refuse to teach. But in another way, they, they leave out the teach, the teaching that we have. Okay, does anybody have any more points before we wrap up? What about the real Josephine? What about the real senior people who are kind of sickly or who are not capable and they're not teaching the message? How do you how do you view them? So we have elderly people in our movement. Is a nine year old child in this movement a priest? Josephine? Just yes or no? Okay. Don't know. You, you don't know? No? At what age did you graduate? Twelve. Twelve. So you're going through a biblical model of twelve? Not twenty? Because 12 were for boys, you know. And 20 was... Okay, anyone else? I thought everyone's a priest. And so we don't expect a young child, even at 12, to do baptismal classes as a teacher. So... Of course, there are people who are not well or who are feeble physically and mentally. Age is just one issue. There are people who, are, who have mental health challenges that would struggle. So if I gave the impression that we should 
capture everybody, even those who actually aren't either mentally well or who aren't physically well and insist that they teach, then that wasn't the point that I was trying to make. So I agree with you, Josephine. But if you're going to say that an elderly person is too old to teach, but they're still priests. Which is, I think, the argument that you're making. Doesn't it go the other way around as well? That even the children should therefore be considered as priests. even though they're not capable of teaching. Okay, I want to summarize as we close. I've, come, I've been coming over this subject over and over again to understand whether or not we are a radical movement. Either just in name, or in practice, because people have different ideas of what they imagine a radical feminist organization would look like. One of them is the selection process. Both past or legacy issues and present. And if we're not happy with the existing framework, existing practices, I want people to know that there's a willingness, not only on my part, but if I can speak on behalf of other leaders, to change. But if you change it, 